I thank you. On the show tonight, two giants of popular music. One sold 100 million records in a career lasting over 30 years. He is Lionel Richie. The other is the infant prodigy, who was playing piano with the symphony orchestra at age nine, who became a singer, songwriter, and actor. He is Harry Connick, Jr. But first, the former cub reporter on a local paper in Yorkshire, who went on to international success in the X-Men movies. He's best known as the first man from Dewsbury to go where no man's gone before when he became an intergalactic superstar as captain of the Starship Enterprise. Ladies and gentlemen, Patrick Stewart. <laughs> Must have been great fun making that series. How did uh, I mean, were you ever tempted to, to, to play it with a Yorkshire accent, Jean Luc? Um, I, I always, I think every role that I play, I start out trying to convince the director I should play it with a Yorkshire accent. Um, we did toy with the Yorkshire accent. It was incomprehensible to the producers in Hollywood. <laughs> but we only toyed with it after they had tried to persuade me to do him French. They put me on camera. Somewhere this film must exist. But the fact is, I sounded like uh, Inspector Clouseau. Uh, and, <laughs> and, uh, and that wouldn't have been appropriate. On the other hand, can you imagine? <clears throat> Space. Final frontier. <laughs> <laughs> These are voyagers of the Star Trek. No, no. <laughs> yeah. no, you're comfortable with that. Uh, I am. Uh, I doubt if they cool. would have been uh, well, in middle America. It would have been an even bigger success, lad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wonderful, wouldn't it, to sort of imagine some films done with North Country, like Brief Encounter, you know, I hope, and all that sort of thing. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it wouldn't be really romantic, would it? You, you, I'm sure you know about the, the, the actor Barry Rutter and his oh, company yes. Northern Broadside. Yeah. Th they do all kinds of classic plays, but they do them broad northern. And they're marvellous, yeah, too. I mean, the, the language comes alive. It's so rich, isn't it? It's wonderful. Well, of course, listen to us, Michael. Of I know. course it's rich but, and see, alive. Now, now, you're starting to speak Yorkshire. It's your influence. I know, it's terrible. <laughs> Ian McKellen, who you know, of course, because of the, uh, you star alongside him in X-Men, mm -hmm. he was saying the, the other day to me that, that he wished that he kept his accent, more of it, in fact. I mean, mm -hmm. he, like you, uh, you know, started with, he's, he's Lancashire, of course, we don't normally speak about people from there, but, but he's in <laughs> Lancashire. Uh, they don't matter. And, uh, but, but he decided, like you, 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 to get work, you had to have a, the... the, the, the the, the standard, proper, the standard English, English yeah. received pronunciation. That's right. But, but did you, I mean, I don't know, I suppose it, it would be impossible, wouldn't it? For it? a period of time, I lived a double life because um, I, I didn't just, you would understand, Barnsley, right? Barnsley. Yes. Um, it wasn't just the accent. I spoke a dialect, as I assume. You, but you were a grammar school boy, weren't you? You probably didn't have a dialect. Oh, no, so, here we go. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> We talked about this before, didn't this is, we? This is my... I won't go there, Michael, with you at all. <laughs> this professional Yorkshireism, you know, it's not for me. Um, <laughs> what was it? Oh, yes, yes, right. Bounce so it. I had to learn not only a different way of pronouncing mm. words, I had to learn different words. For example, um, if I would go to a friend's house, see if he was coming out to play, I, what would I say to him? I'd knock on the door, he'd come to the door, what would I say? Are you coming out to play? Oh, no, you see, you are a grammar school boy. <laughs> <laughs> I told him, up. At a lakin. At a lakin up. Yeah. Now, lakin yeah. means playing. Playing. Right. In the 17th century, actors in the north of England were known as lakers, players, oh, in right. other words. Right. So I had to learn another language as well as a different way of pronouncing words. So for a period of time, from the age of about 13 to 15, 16, I would have one accent for the weekend when I was. <laughs> uh, going to my drama coach and doing Shakespeare and another accent all the way during at, the week because it would have been intolerable intolerable to have brought my weekend accent into the school playground absolutely uh, they'd have thought you were wrong on too wouldn't they I mean I mean the people with an accent like that I mean but yeah. absolutely you get get walled right away yeah. yes so but th th it was interesting your back I mean just tell us briefly about your background because without playing the professional Yorkshireman I mean it, it was a it was an impoverished background in many ways wasn't it uh, yes it was yes. tough it, it was yes uh, I, I, having been mocked once, I, I'll <laughs> risk being mocked a second time. But hiding behind the sofa when the rent man came, yes, that I was that. familiar and, and territory. What, do you have an outside toilet? Yes. Uh, do you yes. have the news of the world and a pin on the wall? <laughs> <All sorts. laughs> you said, it was... You said, I'm on a nail. <laughs> The news of the world. We're going back to the we same place back. again. Know. Let's, let's, yeah. Shall we? No, no, we won't go any further than that. But I'll tell you one thing, a way in which it affected my life. When I went to California, a lot of houses... When I was looking for somewhere to live, a lot of houses there are what they call open plan. Yes. Every room just, they call it, it has excellent flow, the realtors say. 
And so one room opens, one room opens up onto another. Uh, my realtor finally discovered that she should never take me to see these houses. I needed doors. Yes. I needed to be able to shut rooms off. And it, I realized it came from all of us living in one room where you couldn't shut anything off at all, which is why, and this is the last time we'll mention it, the outside toilet <laughs> was so important because that was my library, my study, my refuge. Yeah, you sit know. there and read. That's absolutely right. <laughs> oh, hours, yeah, hours, hours right. and hours. Right. Candle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But we're not going to go there yeah, anymore. Go there, no. <laughs> but we won't, we, we won't go there, will we? No. no. <laughs> Tell me then, about, well, then, then there you were, there was this young cub reporter there with, with aspirations to be a, 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 an actor. You eventually went to Bristol to the old bit there, and then you, you, you started, well, played in many, many roles. You're in work, Royal Shakespeare Company, without people taking notice of you. So how did you get this, make this extraordinary quantum leap into, into this superstardom? Well, I, I feel I've got to defend myself a little bit. I wouldn't say that nobody took any notice well, of me. Well, right? I mean, in terms but, of international stardom, I'm talking My about. mother saw everything that I did. Uh, yes, in international terms, um, when, when the pilot episode of Star Trek aired, and it was a fluke how I got it, I was, I was uh, assisting a professor of English at UCLA to lecture on Shakespeare. I was giving some illustrations, and the producer, one of the producers of Star Trek, was signed up for the course of public lectures. That's how I got it. Right. Well, that's how I was seen, anyway. Yes. Um, but what was it about you that, that made them decide? Do you know what we told? What was it? I mean... Uh, I don't know. Th 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 this man claims that um, I in the middle of this lecture, he turned to his wife and said, we found the captain. And he had no doubts about it. Gene Roddenberry had many, many doubts about it. And so did the executives at Paramount. Um, you know, a middle-aged, bald Englishman. Yes. It seemed very improbable that they should cast such a person in this iconic American role. In fact, when the Los Angeles Times uh, first commented on this new production. I was described as unknown British Shakespearean, Patrick <laughs> Stewart. And somebody made a sign up and they hung it on my trailer door which said, beware, unknown British Shakespearean. <laughs> what about, what, I mean, was, was the, did, did they hold the boldness against you? I mean, was there a feeling that perhaps in the 24th century, well, which is when this thing right, is... Right, yes, is that, that, that came up at the very first press conference. Uh, a reporter asked Gene Roddenberry, um, Look, you know, it doesn't make any sense. You've got a bald actor playing this part. Surely, by the 24th century, they will have found a cure for male pattern baldness. <laughs> and Gene Roddenberry said, no, by the 24th century, no one will care. Oh, good remark. It was, yeah, it was one of the nicest things that's ever been said about men like me. Well, but, but, but nobody cares. You're fashionable now, aren't you? You're, Ooh. in fact, ahead of fashion. Yeah, and it was nice for a while when I saw all of these shaved heads, but it, it began to irritate me, frankly. You know, when somebody has a magnificent head of hair that, honestly, when I was 19, I would have loved to have had. And they shave it all off, and I feel that somehow they're kind of infringing on my territory. A little is, that, is that when you lost your hair at 19? 19. It all happened within the space of a year. It was horrible. It was horrible. I thought everything was over, especially, you know, one aspect of my life. Ladies. I Finished. Know. Was it? Nobody's going to want... Was it? Over? Yeah, no, and, and that time, not later. I know it wasn't later, but, but was it? Was it <laughs> you know nothing, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're, you're making it up. <laughs> no, it actually wasn't. But, but I, I felt I was inhibited by it. Yes. I, I, I would have been bolder in my relationship with young women than I was. Yes. Well, it, and it was probably all for the best. Absolutely. It, it, I think we should be circumspect when we're 19, actually, but we just have a lot of problems. But did you have a, you had a flap, didn't you? You had the old Bobby Charles? Yeah, I did. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, and I, I wore, wore hats all the time, uh, yeah. caps, uh, especially if it was windy, because, you know, the thing would happen. <laughs> I mean, that was always so silly about Bobby, wasn't it? I yeah. mean, the worst possible job he had for yeah. having one of those <laughs> Um, shall I tell you how I lost it? Yeah. Um, I, uh, there was a man who had been at school with me, at drama school, uh, Hungarian. He was older than the rest of us. He'd run his own theatre in Budapest. He came out in 56. And uh, he, he was a man of strong personality and, and a good, loyal friend to me. He was also a judo black belt. He was very short and very powerful. He invited me, and his wife invited me for lunch one day. And um, we had lunch. It was very nice, bottle of wine. And the two of them got up at the end of of the lunch, and I thought they were going to make coffee or something, and all of a sudden I was grabbed from behind by George, this big, powerful man. And he, I thought he was playing some kind of game, so I was laughing and joking. And then his wife appeared in front of me with a pair of scissors. <laughs> and, and I knew in an instant what she was going to do, and I began to scream and shout, and now it was serious. I was fighting. 
I mean, I was fighting to keep my appearance. And she lifted it up and she cut it all off. And then George, he worked his way around, still holding me, he came around and he knelt down in front of me and he said, now you be yourself, no more hiding. And he was right because I used to walk like this. <laughs> you know, because I was embarrassed about this thing and so I couldn't stand up properly. You know, it was, it was not only inhibiting as a person, it was hopeless if you're an actor, of course. Yes, you know, so you have to wear a toupee, do you? I did, yes. I, I never wore one. Um, socially, yes. but I used to wear it when I went up for jobs. Um, the one occasion that it rebounded on me, I got an audition for the National Theatre for Laurence Olivier, and I went down to their, uh, their little uh, setup there they had down at the cut in Waterloo, and I did what I always did. I wore the toupee uh, to the audition, so I could put it on myself. It was really good. It looked entirely natural. And I went in, and I did my first piece with the toupee, and and he was sitting there right in front of me, and it was a nerve-wracking experience, you can imagine, you know, a young actor. And uh, I finished it, and I, I started to explain what my second piece would be. And as I did that, I started doing this, you see, with my fingers, and I'm talking to him all the time, and I unclip from back, and I take it off, and I put it down on the chair beside me, and I start my second piece. Well, I can see immediately that I haven't got his attention. He's, he's looking down here, <laughs> like this. And um, when I'd finished, uh, he said, do it again. <laughs> and I said, you want me to do one of the pieces again? He said, no, 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 take that off and do it again. <laughs> Put it on and take it off. <laughs> and, and I did, and he said, marvellous, that's marvellous. And I swear it was the only thing about my audition he remembered. <laughs> so it's obviously storing it away in case sometime he had to do a... I waited for the moment in, in one of movie, his performances yeah, when he would do something like yeah, that. But, yeah. you know, those days are now past and um, I can relish what I have. Well, absolutely. It's been a remarkable, remarkable story. Let's just go back briefly to, to, to the, uh, the Starship Enterprise. I mean, what, what was it about that series, do you think? I mean, it, it lasted for so long, not because it was just entertaining. It was on a different level, wasn't it, in, in the end? It, this cult, iconic thing it became. Mm. Why? Have you ever sort of thought about it? Obviously, you have. I think it, it, it was great storytelling, and good storytelling, I think, lies at the root of all in truly interesting, exciting film, television, theatre, radio, whatever. Then there was a core group of really interesting characters, contrasting characters, and well acted. But then there was the other aspect to it, the, the fundamental philosophy of Star Trek, which was a very optimistic, some might even say a utopian philosophy that Gene Roddenberry had, that 300 years from now, 200 years from now, the world, the planet, even our solar system would be a significantly better place to live. No poverty, no racism, mm. no disease, mm. you know. Mm. Um, and and it, it, without being sentimental, it created hope for people. The best way of illustrating this, I think, is to tell a story when in the second season, Whoopi Goldberg joined the cast at her request, she was at that point at the height of her film career. She just won an Academy Award. And she called up Gene Roddenberry and asked to be written into the series. Well, it's, it's unique that a film actress should want to be in a syndicated yes. television show. So soon after she started work with us, I asked her why. And she told me this story. She was growing up on the Upper West Side in, uh, in Manhattan. And she watched the original series. And there on this series was this black woman, Uhuru, played by Nichelle Nichols, who had authority on the bridge. People listened to her. They obeyed her orders. She had a commanding attitude. She was a strong and, and uh, dominant and interesting, intelligent, vibrant woman. And Whoopi said, I would sit there as a kid growing up in Manhattan, a black kid, and I would say to myself, well, by the 24th century, one of us made it. <laughs> and and it's, I think it's, it's, it's that sense, yeah. you know, yeah. that, that yeah. we will make it and it will be better. Yes. It's interesting. It's, um... What about the, 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 the people who followed it, who, who became Trekkies, who, mm -hmm. who became obsessed, in a sense, with the, with the show? Did, did you find them at all threatening or no, silly? No, no, the, the Trekkies were never threatening. Um, uh, <laughs> no, the threats always came from other quarters. Uh, they've had a bad press. Um, uh, even there was a film made about them called Trekkies, yes. ma made by so, one of our own kind, and, and I was very unhappy about that film because it focused on an extreme minority of the fan base of Star Trek. Um, 
you know, there was a dentist whose whole surgery was done out like the Enterprise, and he wore, yeah, I know, yeah, he wore a Starfleet uniform while he was, you know, giving you fillings. Um, and, and, uh, and the people who dress up and put on all the makeup and so forth, it's a bit extreme. The fact of the matter is that 99% of the fans uh, don't dress up, um, don't put on makeup, they, they just appreciate the show. And now, of course, you're involved in another huge franchise, which is the X-Men. Yes. I mean, do, do you like this sort of sense of a repertory feeling, which, do, which it must yeah. be? I, I do, Michael. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's been wonderful for me because I was always drawn to companies. I was drawn to the idea of ensemble work. Um, it's nice to be a star. It's nice to stand out and be a celebrity. But I always like the sense of community and family, which is why for the first five years, I worked in repertory with permanent companies, yes. with the same yeah. yes. director, yes. Or, director yes. or two. Yes. And then with the RSC, it was the same thing again. With Star Trek, it was the same yes, thing. Exactly. And now we have this extraordinary group of actors on X-Men. Um, and, and we have, again, that same sense of ensemble and unity, including um, uh, three English actors I'd never worked with before, Sir Ian McKellen, Brian Cox, and Alan Cumming, who both joined us before. And, by the way, because you brought Ian up earlier, this may be a good opportunity for me to scuttle once and for all some extremely unpleasant rumours. I heard one about you with a, a feather boa oh, doing a dance. But I mean, I didn't... How do they get about these stories? What? There is no truth in the rumour that at my birthday party at Sir Ian McKellen's house, year before last, that my gift from him was a white feather boa. No truth in this rumour whatsoever. There is no truth in the rumour that at some point in the party, Ian and I, both of us wearing this feather boa, did the last number from Chorus Line. It's not <laughs> the truth. I'm glad that you made that clear I'm, well, to our audience. Well, thanks for the opportunity, <laughs> you know, to put this to rest. And finally, you're, you're coming back here to live. Uh, mm -hmm. You're going to live in Yorkshire, aren't you? I, I've actually... <clears throat> I've had a house in Yorkshire for nearly 13 years. Have yes, you? In North Yorkshire. Oh, wonderful. That's it is wonderful. Beautiful up there. It's paradise. It never leaves you, does it, really? We're going we're gonna to end this interview where we started <laughs> it. <laughs> Down those mean streets. <laughs> well, no, not mean streets, no, because I'm, I'm very lucky. I live in the National Park, in, oh, the, in the Dales beautiful. National Park. But I will tell you this. Um, in the middle of Hollywood, there were times, often when I, sleeping was difficult, a lot of pressure with the show, all I had to do was stand at the bottom of my driveway and imagine walking up onto the top of the moor where my house is. And by the time I got there, I was always sweetly asleep. <laughs> Patrick Stewart, thank you very much indeed. Patrick Stewart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> music now from one of the great names of popular music. He's a singer, piano player, songwriter, and star of Hollywood movies like Copycat and Hope Floats. He's currently starring in the American sitcom Will and Grace. His new album is called Only You. It's romantic, it's stylish, it's what we expect from Harry Connick Jr. <laughs>
uh, my, my kind of music, our kind of music. Yeah, wonderful stuff. Great Thank American you. ensemble. Your idea to revisit it, or? It was sort of my idea with the, the persuasion of the president of my record company. He, uh, <laughs> he grew up in the 50s, and he asked me if I would ever consider doing a record of songs from his generation. And I knew the songs from the 50s and 60s from, from the jazz perspective. But I said, what kind of songs are you talking about? And he started mentioning songs like Only You and More, I Only Have Eyes For You. I said, I never even, I, I never, even, it never occurred to me to sing pop hits from that time. Yeah. So I went in the studio and, and with about 12 tunes and, and started recording them. And it was a great experience because they're, they're, they're different than songs written prior to that. And that's, they, they seem to be a, a little more simple and a little bit yeah. more accessible somehow. Yeah, yeah. Touring again? Yeah, we'll road? be touring. We start uh, in New Orleans at the end of April at the Jazz Fest which will be a lot of fun. That's always a fun place to play. That's back home, isn't it? That's right. I started playing at the Jazz Fest uh, first time I was eight years old. And I went up to do a sound check, and the guy behind the mixing board says, get, get that kid off the stage. You know, we got a show to do. And, and I said, but I'm playing. I'm playing. It's, it's my show today. Were you ever aware of, it, it interests me about being that child prodigy that you were, because from a very early age, three or four, you just started playing piano. I mean, are you aware that you're different from other people? You make me sound like a Klingon. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are in a sense. You're, you're, that, you're that kind of a freak, aren't you? I mean, you're, you're other Thank people. Thank you. <laughs> in the nicest possible sense. Shall talent. I show you my third ear in the back <laughs> of my head? <laughs> a talented freak. I mean, there you are. I mean, you, you didn't have a lesson. You just sat down and started playing. Well, I, I, just, I just liked it, you know? Sometimes I watch, like, uh, they show uh, young tennis players or, like, guys like Tiger Woods, and they're swinging a golf club at the age of three, and I'm saying, you know, how do they do that? And it's not necessarily that they were doing anything significant. It's just their passion for it was so strong. And I had a similar experience with the piano. I just loved to play. That's all I, that's all I ever did. I didn't play sports. I didn't, I didn't do anything else. Yes. What, what kind of mentors did you have in New Orleans in the jazz scene there? Because oh, I should so think it was many. rather colorful, wasn't oh, it? It was unbelievable. Oh, yeah. I used to go, uh, there was a club called The Famous Door. And when I was 14, my mother died when I was 13. And that sort of changed our family life and so it was just me and my sister and myself and I think my dad kind of softened up a little bit on the on the discipline and I got a call to play this show at the famous door in the French Quarter and it was from 11 at night till 3 in the morning my dad said you can do it and I couldn't believe it so I showed up at the club and the drummer was about where you are to me and he was hitting these rim shots all night long and it started to really give me an earache so I took some, you guys call it cotton wool over yeah, here, sure. and I shoved it in my ear. And as the night progressed, I shoved it deeper and deeper and deeper until it got so far lodged in my ear, I couldn't get it out. And it must have been pressing on some kind of nerve or something, because every time he would hit that drum, this <laughs> riveting pain would shoot through the right side of my body. So about 12 o'clock, I called my dad. I said, Dad, you got to help me out. So my dad comes down on the French court, and he's got his pajamas on. He's wearing a trench coat over that. <laughs> waves to me to come to the corner and I'm, he's got my head like this and he's he's digging this thing out of my ear I'm trying to be cool you know with the other musicians you know and oh, it was just one of those one of those things but well, your dad of course had a great influence on your on your musically because he, he himself is a, a musical man he sings doesn't he it's a very interesting story my dad was the district attorney of New Orleans for 30 years up until last January and he's 77 now and about 10 years ago I guess he's so comfortable on stage being a politician and talking in front of people. Plus, he has a, a good ear and a nice voice. I said, Dad, why don't you come up and sing? He says, all right, why don't you write a couple of charts for me? So he's got me writing charts for him. <laughs> so I wrote the charts, and he sang, like, When You're Smiling or something. And I thought people were going to say, oh, very nice. Man, he went nuts. I mean, he just took the whole show over. I couldn't even follow it. So now he sings around town. He's got, and what he does, he'll put on, on, the, on the bill, it'll say, Harry Connick Sr. <laughs> like that, you know, and so, you know, he's doing, you know, it's an I interesting dynamic that we have, but, no, he's doing great. What about your own children? Are they musical? You've got three small children. I have three, three uh, daughters, seven, six, and a year and a half, mm. and the older two are, are playing piano. I, I had to get them a, a piano lesson, because, uh, a piano teacher, because I, I don't think, well, they don't listen to me anyway. I know they wouldn't listen to me with regard to taking piano lessons. But I'm peering around that corner watching that lady like a hawk, man, making sure she's teaching them the right thing. <laughs> she's doing a good job. Well, what, do you interfere generally in, in like that? I mean, are you that kind of interfering father? I didn't think I would be until I started going to the, to the soccer matches. Uh, they, they, my seven-year-old is on a, on a soccer team, and, and I, I, I started to get into it with the ref because I don't know the rules. I have no idea how to play. I know American football pretty well, but 
I don't, I don't know soccer at all. And, and it looked to me like the ball was out of bounds. They're kicking it out of bounds, kicking it out of bounds, kicking it out of bounds on the other team. I said, hey, my friend, you, you're not watching the ball here, bro. I said, the, the ball is supposed to be on this side of the line. And I'm yelling at him and yelling at him. And, the, and the, one of the other mothers pulls me back and says, hey, man, you can't, you can't treat the ref like that. And I think adding to the fact that he was 11 probably <laughs> had something to, to do with that. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, I mean, there's more anger and more ambition channeled into to, to kids in sport than there is the, the famously the, the some moms who have this thing about their kids going to drama school. You know, there's the, the sort of theater moms. I mean, those it's sports. Intense. Are, I it's but I'm, that's not my kind of. That's not me though. I don't want to be that guy, but I'm that guy. You are that guy. <laughs> yeah. Course, yeah. And I'm eating their oranges and stuff. They have oranges, and they and I'm eating their food, and they're yelling at me because I can't bring their. Food. <laughs> they have they have counseling for people like you. You know, they have counseling for sports parents. Do they really? <laughs> yeah. Well, when my when, when my, my when my oldest one was was in preschool, some little boy was messing around with her, and she bang, she punched him in the face. And they said, Mr. Connick, you have to come down and check the situation. They said, your, your little girl just punched this boy in the face. And I gave her a high five. I said, man, that's, you know, you, somebody's pushing her around. You know, you, you, she, that little boy's not going to mess with her anymore. And boy, did I get it from my wife, from my dad, from the school. <laughs> they said, you can't encourage violence like that. And, you know, I really kind of had my tail between my legs. And uh, I took my daughter uh, to a room. I said, look. You can't be hitting people like that, but it was it was a hell of a shot, though, and I gave a five. <laughs> <laughs> what about your, your, your own behavior? Because, again, I mean, you, you had a bit, caused a bit of controversy, didn't you, on a show in, uh, in America where you talked about uh, going to Canada, I think, to promote this, this album we're talking See, about. See, you, you all are a lot different than we are over there. Like the whole episode at the Super Bowl halftime show, how we view that and how you, I mean, you all probably didn't think much of that. It's just well, a... Janet Jackson exposing her breasts. Yeah, it's, it, it's not... It didn't well, we'd, we've seen that before. I, yeah, right, but in, in, <laughs> what was amazing to me is that, uh, like, the whole event leading up to that was what I thought was profoundly suggestive, and it's just kind of backwards in America how we look at things. Well, I was on this television show, and, and I was in, uh, talking about a trip. I was in uh, Quebec City, and it was 40 below, and they said, uh, you know, was it r unbelievably cold? And, I, and I, I guess I can say it over here. It's not going to sure. make it back across. I hope not anyway. They said, I said, it was cold. My, my, I said, my penis looks like a stack of buttons. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> man, I'm telling you, I, I didn't, I, I, I truthfully <laughs> didn't think I was saying anything that was that bad. And, man, I got it. I got it from family. I got it from, <laughs> I mean, I really, and I'm saying, my God, you know, I mean, it, it, it's really, it's a, it's a strange society, that America. It's, you, it's, uh, <laughs> I really it's, had to kind of back, you know, pull back the reins or something. It's a very, it's a very intriguing image that you create there, actually. <laughs> Have you thought of leaving your body for medical research, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> maybe to a haberdasher instead, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, you said the, the, the perception over here is, is entirely different uh, and uh, a little bit sort of more broad-minded than that, if that's the, the right word. But, but <laughs> this is a, a, a place where you've been visiting now for well, quite a few years now. You first came over here, Memphis Bell, wasn't it? Was that that's right. I spent, uh, I guess, I f it's very embarrassing for me to talk about an acting experience sitting next to you, I have to say. <laughs> so, like, I was just talking about, like, you know, hit records with Lionel Richie backstage. I feel, could you put me in between two... <laughs> Worst people to make me intimidated, you know. He's talking about it. He, yeah, yeah. His this one song you wrote sold 18 million records, and you're yeah. talking about the Shakespearean theater. I'm I'm just white trash from Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's, yeah, sure. let's get that right. Sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah. You, you know, talented white right yeah. 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 Although, I mean, I mean, again, I mean, looking at you now, this lovely, innocent face you have. Who cast you as a killer, a serial killer? Oh, you play that that's very... your boy, John Emile, from yes, over here. That's right. That's very convincing. That. Was. Well, it was a movie called Copycat, Copycat, and they said it's about serial killers. They want you to play this demented character. And I sat in a room with this man. I hadn't read the script, <clears> and uh, he said, "Well, what do you know about serial killers?" I said, "Well, just what you know, I've read in the paper and, and things like that." <laughs> And uh, <laughs> he, we talked for about 10 minutes, and then he sent me home, and I, I called my manager. I said, yes, another waste of time. I didn't get this part, and I got the part. And I'm thinking, what in the hell did I demonstrate <laughs> in normal conversation to this man to lead him to believe I could play this complete... Well, you already said I was a freak, but a complete... <laughs> a, uh, you know, a freak like that. I mean, I have no idea what I did. 
It was very, very convincing, I have to tell you. I think it was the accent, because he was from here, and he just, you know, you, you start, if you embellish the southern accent, I think he's like, oh, that's, that's what I want, that's what I want right there, kind of, you know, saying words that, that he, he didn't understand and stuff. How did you, <laughs> how, how did you, um, how do you so get, get on with Ms. Weaver? Do you convince her that you are? Well, Sigourney Weaver was the lead in it, and, yes. and my character was tormenting her character, and I think she had never met me before, and she didn't introduce herself to me the whole shoot. She was taking judo lessons, and she was real freaked out about my character. I'm like, even though I look quite different in the part, I would say, Sigourney, you know, everything's, everything's cool. I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna slit your throat. And she was, uh, she didn't really wanna, uh, deal with me. Maybe it was a character thing. Maybe uh, she was she afraid of me. Like yeah, no, didn't, no, didn't no, like maybe. me. Maybe she's You're so just frightening. Maybe she saw through you, I don't know. <laughs> right. Did she see the stack of buttons? Is that what you're no, saying? That's not good. <laughs> she saw the buttons. Could be it. This she could saw be it. the buttons. I haven't seen them and I'm frightened. <laughs> Be afraid, be very <laughs> afraid, yeah. You don't like the, I read you, the, the, one of the things you didn't like about acting, or don't like about acting, is the audition process. Is yeah. it fear of rejection, do you think? Absolutely. It is. Oh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. no doubt about it, you know. <laughs> they're not gonna like you. I see, I can never work out about acting. I really the, can't the worst, take that rejection. The worst, rege the worst audition I ever did, <laughs> you'll get a kick out of this. I auditioned, and, and I was shocked that I didn't get the role. It was for one of the male leads in Portrait of a Lady with my voice, uh -huh. <laughs> and it was like, took place in like 18th century England, and I'm like, hey, bro, <laughs> I, don't you understand, I'm, you know, I can play this role. <laughs> and they were like, I'm sorry, but you can't, you know. <laughs> so now you're on tour, you're gonna be on tour shortly, touring. Do, do you ever get tired of that, fed up with touring? I get tired of being away from my kids yeah, uh, and my wife. I love to yeah. be home with them, but we've kind of worked it out so that I can, because we're doing one-nighters uh, every night, and uh, I can't really bring them with me there in school, and, and uh, my wife's taking care of the, them and the baby, so it's hard for me to get away. But, uh, you know, I love it. I was talking to, to Lionel uh, backstage, and after that, there's a musical that I'm writing uh, that we're gonna be... Uh, I want to do a new musical, you know? When you say a new musical, one, I mean, new a music, total original from the beginning. Total original, book, I'm writing the music, and I'll do the orchestrations, and.